The empty autumn grounds of Sydney's Wallara Public School are welcoming back the sound of 777 school kids. We're super excited. We are really looking forward to the kids coming back. All our parents, uh, they're excited about coming back. We've just been reassuring them about everything we've got in place to ensure that the kids are going to be safe. So yes, they're, they're leaving their, their kind of bubble of home. Principal Nicole Malloy and her staff's rapid pivot to flexible online learning during the crisis now switches back to face-to-face. -to -face. Getting some games out. Fantastic. And I'm just showing that how this one works. You know a lot more about responding to these crises than you did three months ago. So does that make you more ready in case it might happen again? Yeah, absolutely. I feel we'd be well prepared if, if there was any, any sort of hurdle along the way. Parents too, for the sake of their children's education, are putting aside their fears of a resurgence of coronavirus. We're so happy to be sending them back to school. And have you missed your friends at school? I've missed them a lot. It'll be great to see my friends again. We were terribly worried about actually getting their education still sorted out. With schools in New South Wales returning to full-time face-to-face study, it's the surest sign yet that things are beginning to return to normal. But the new normal, at least until a vaccine becomes widely available, must require a careful management of small clusters of COVID-19 outbreak, especially in the most densely populated parts of Australia, like here in Sydney's eastern suburbs. Nearby is the Bondi drive through testing clinic. Australia is doing everything we can to prevent a resurgence which might result in having to move backwards and to reimpose some of the restrictions which have been lifted. We know that to do so would have a devastating effect on our currently recovering economy. Experts say despite our nation's success at flattening the curve, we're still vulnerable. We believe that an extremely small percentage of the Australian population have had COVID-19 and that means that we're all susceptible should we get a second wave of transmission and that's likely to be the case for 6, 12, possibly even another 18 months. So this is the new normal for us. If some level of infection is somewhat inevitable for the sake of the economy and society reopening, then test, track and trace investigation is the only weapon we have. We'll do little cluster investigations around those people and test their close contacts. And that's been very important in control of the, nurse, the New March House nursing home outbreaks, for instance. Health authorities have learned to track and trace during some of the largest clusters we've seen. For example, Cedar Meats in Victoria, the two Melbourne McDonald's restaurants, Newmarch House in Sydney, and of course the largest known outbreak, the Ruby Princess cruise ship, linked to cases across the country and around the world. The Doherty Institute in Victoria established using genomic sequencing, there were 76 separate clusters. I guess what the genomics uncovers is the virus can move quite quickly. These clusters are dead end clusters and so they, the spread stops and uh, the social, social distancing really prevents their ongoing spread. We have been seeing this occurring in some other countries where restrictions have been lifted and where a resurgence has occurred. In the United States, new disease modelling from Columbia University has shown that 36,000 fewer people would have died if the US adopted social distancing just one week earlier. Another country Australia can learn from is South Korea. Korea is a very good sort of advanced warning case study. For 18 days in a row, Seoul, a metropolis of nearly 10 million people, reported zero cases of community transmission. South Korea had started to feel fairly back to normal, um, and now uh, tensions are ar arising once more with a cluster that's been brewing. Authorities here have been doing very intense contact tracing. Um, a little more than 200 cases have been traced to this one cluster um, it, it, that started out of a nightclub district. Um, but that has had butterfly effects throughout the society. One of the very interesting things about their current cluster of cases, it occurred in a group that are, are very uncomfortable about being identified. 
The district, popular with nightclubbers, was shuttered again. The authorities vigorously tracked patrons via cell tower data. There is really a sense of blame against um, the people who are messing it up for the rest of the population. What Australia can learn from the South Korean experience is the importance of being alert, the importance of having an excellent testing and contact tracing system, because this outbreak, this pandemic is not over uh, until it's over everywhere. Intensive care units like this one at Royal Melbourne Hospital are now much better prepared than they were three months ago when case numbers first spiked. We're increasingly confident we're not going to see a tsunami of patients arriving. I think the expectation is that we'll be receiving uh, a number of patients over the next several months, but at any one time we might have somewhere between one to five patients with COVID in our ICU, which is um, a lot better than contemplating looking after 50 to 100 patients. Ten new ICU beds are now on standby, as well as 40 more ventilators. Increasingly, we are looking in the post-COVID world as we live with COVID. We're very concerned about older Australians who are living in residential aged care facilities. The most vulnerable age group remains isolated in more ways than one. We know that we live in an area that there's been a number of outbreaks. We don't know where the people go and where they've been. We've only been out three times. And, and two of those times were early in the morning. What you want to do is have things that people can actually read. In northwest Melbourne, 71 year old Anita Smith and husband Dwight operate an internal TV channel inside their retirement village to give the many computer illiterate residents vital information on COVID 19. Really, we're talking about any cold and flu symptoms. Don't presume that everyone can use technology. I would say there would be a huge percentage in the village that haven't got that app. They wouldn't know how to do it. They wouldn't have had access to people to help them to do the app. While the lockdown is easing for some, the threat of a secondary outbreak remains a threat to all. We have social interaction, but I have friends that I'm extremely worried about who are in, in lockdown and have been all the time. So very clearly in Australia, there are a number of populations that we're very concerned about. I think everybody is concerned about doing all we can to prevent a second wave. Hi, I'm Lee Sales. Thanks for watching this story. If you'd like to watch more of 730's stories, they are on the left of your screen. And tap on the button below to subscribe and get the latest from ABC News.